recording. Again, good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Garayas, and this class is MED 110, Anatomy and Physiology. Um, this is week one. This is our first lecture. Zoom lectures are at uh, Tuesday evenings at 6 p.m. It is March 16th. And task one, discussion one, and lesson one is due by next class, which is Tuesday, um, uh, whatever, uh, seven days from now, what is it, 23rd? or, or well, whatever next Tuesday is, or the next class session by 6 p.m. And that's task one, discussion one, and lesson one. And we'll be going over um, how to do those things. And task one's easy. It's just uh, signing the form because um, this particular class has laboratory sessions that will run uh, week eight, week nine, week 10, which will all be announced here in the announcements. So uh, check these announcements regularly they're really important because they'll have, um, they'll have information about the Zoom session. They could have notes, they could have um, uh, practice items for your midterm and your final. So how does this class gonna go down? So we uh, look at the course syllabus. Hopefully it's cooperating with us. If not, I could do it by almost memory, been teaching it a while. And again, while that's loading up, you guys know, here's my cell, here's my email. I try to answer even, with, even on weekends within 24 hours. If I don't answer within 24 hours, uh, um, give me a call, uh, give me another call. So let's say for example, and also tell me what class you're talking about. I'm currently teaching five classes. So uh, I've got a decent amount of students and some of you I have for, uh, for two classes. So. Um, if you have an inquiry or a question or something's bothering you, you got to tell me which class we're talking about. And for this class, of course, is MED 110, Anatomy and Physiology. So the syllabus is um, the document that's located right here on your main course page. And that has to deal with uh, all the legalities of uh, what this class entails. Of course, my contact information here. And think about it, anatomy and physiology. So Everything on any midterm or final or any exercise that we're doing, we'll be dealing with anatomy, which is the parts or cutting uh, into parts, if you recall your medical terminology, and the physio physiology, logi, study of how they all work together. And we'll be talking about, um, and all of these things, we'll be talking about normal situations or the homeostatic mechanisms. And if you recall, homeostasis, stasis means to stand in one place, homeo means the same. So that's all your body wants to do. It wants to be in the middle. It wants to have any balance. And for your future, you'll be taking pathology classes, which talk about the imbalance, talk about how all the normal becomes abnormal. So knowing normal, knowing your anatomy, the parts and physiology, how the parts work together is important. And we're gonna be doing uh, uh, the chemical basis of life. So we're gonna do a, just a touch on chemistry, a touch on organic chemistry as well, a touch on cell molecular biology, a touch on some of these things. So, uh, because those are all parts on how to make the whole human being. And for the first three to four weeks, um, uh, we'll be talking about um, uh, how all of those parts strive together to keep you alive. And cellular energetics is part of that. Did you ever wonder how do you stay alive? Well, as long as you keep on eating, as long as you keep on breathing, go, the, these processes will keep on going. The second you stop giving your body fuel and your body won't be able to break it down or metabolize to its cellular products. We'll be, gonna talk, we'll be talking about oxygen, glucose, and why do we need those two things to make ATP um, which is adenosine triphosphate, which is the metabolic fuel, which runs our lives. Um, I mentioned cellular biology. We're also uh, going to talk a lot about the cell on week four, uh, all the parts of the cell and the functions of all the cells, and also the function of your um, cellular membrane, how it's not just the skin. And of course, then we're going to go into the different systems the digestive system, urinary, cardiovascular, lymphatic, which is uh, your immune system, respiratory, and we end off with reproductive systems with a concentration 
of female reproduction versus male. It'll be more female than male. Now every week is to worth 10%. Every week you're gonna have, well almost every week, you're gonna have a discussion, task, and lesson. And all of them are due the very next week. So what does that mean? So for example, this week is week one. So you have a task, discussion, and lesson one. That is due next week. Week two stuff is due week three. Week three stuff is week four. So you could sit and ask me every week, what is due? Well, whatever we talked about the week before, that is what is due to make it simple. And every week, when you think about it, is 10%. So if you have a midterm in week five, right, that's 10%. Final in week 10, that's 10%. So that I made it that way so that not one thing can kill you. But if you consistently don't do your discussions, tasks, and lessons, well, uh, you're not going to get the grade that you need. And many of you are nursing, so you must maintain this, a B minus or better, okay? And think about it. Do you want to be that kind of nurse who only knows 80% of the material? Don't be that person. Always strive for much higher than that. But this is the standard for nursing and for everybody else in health science. If you're not in nursing, um, the standard is uh, 2.0 or C or better. Right. Um, and remember, if you look at this breakdown, it's essentially 10% every week. This is another way to look at it. Your tasks are worth 30%, lessons and labs uh, worth 30%, and, dis and discussions are worth 30%. But if you do everything every week, it's 10%. And then your syllabus mirrors your Moodle shell. It's got all the things. Now, University policies, late policy. Again, I have to repeat. Task one, discussion one, lesson one is due next week before 6 p.m. Next Tuesday before 6 p.m. And I forgot. Let me look at the date. What's the date? Uh, it is the 23rd. So 23rd, 6 p.m. If I don't see it, right, and uh, you, all of your work is time stamped, and that's what's the neat part of Moodle. For every day it's late, it's, uh, minus, it goes minus one grade. So it's okay to hand in things late. I know how difficult it is. But again, going back to, especially those of you in the school of nursing, nurses, medical professionals, doctors, time is, is someone's life. So get used to doing things either early or on time. If not, it's a bad habit, uh, bad habit to be. Okay, uh, especially once you uh, work in the field, right? And I always get, well, Dr. Grice, I'll be different when I work in the field. How so? Right? You can't handle getting a task and a discussion and lesson. And let me tell you, I've, I've heard so many sob stories over the weekend for people who didn't make the grade or failed my class. Um, once you get into the ward, and those of you who work in the, um, the medical field already know, no one really cares about your personal life. Okay? So but I do. So if you can't get this stuff to me on time, give me a call, right? Let me help you get this stuff on time. So after class tonight, it'll be easy to go, okay, lecture's over. Okay, I already had, um, I already had, did what I had to do. Why don't you start tackling this stuff or tackle, uh, task one is easy. It's just a hand in. All you have to do for task one for this week is you print out, you just have to print out this lab safety contract and then you, you, know, you just submit it and hand it in, uh, and that's it, I just give you full credit. But what should you be tackling later, right? So let's look at the discussion. Discuss how to use an electron microscope, allows for better visualization for pathogens, right? So what do you do? Every discussion has to be at least uh, you know, around 200 words and with at least one citation. So. All discussions should have a distinct beginning, middle, and end. So, and those of you who had me in class before, you guys know. You already know how to do this. Let me do it just uh, for those of you who haven't had me before. So, I have to have some sort of beginning. So, that's my introduction. I have to have some sort of middle, which is my body, right? And I have to have some sort of end. I have to conclude it. What did I learn? So, for this, what can I put in my, my introduction? First, I have to define certain things, 
What's an electron microscope? What's a pathogen? Is an electron microscope the standard to visualize pathogens? All right, is it practical? All right, so I put that in my definition. And in my, it goes in my introduction, what's your opinion? My opinion is it's awesome, it's great, it's better than sliced bread. Okay, fine, why? Have to have your rationale. Why do you think it's better? And then after that, you have your body. So, evidence to back up everything in your intro. This is the problem with the world, right here. Everyone's got an opinion. Opinions are just like rectums, everyone has one. But not everybody has evidence to back it up. That's why it is so confusing now. Do I get the vaccine? When do I get the vaccine? How do I get the vaccine? Is the vaccine even efficacious? We don't know, there's no evidence. And right now, uh, INOVA is inundated with calls, tens of thousands, because no one agency can give us any answers and give the patient any answers. So I'll get off my soapbox. You guys know I can easily rant uh, about healthcare administration and how, uh, how administrative stuff goes awry. So you find out evidence that, hey, let's say you chose, hey, electron microscopes are awesome. They should have that in every living room. Well, where's your evidence? Does it actually visualize pathogens? Is that the method of choice on how to diagnose things? Right? And if it isn't, why? Where did you get it from? Did you get it from a .gov? Government agency like uh, the Department of Health, it's a vetted site, meaning that people check it regularly. .edu, like a nursing school or a medical school, right? And does a, um, a .org, like a, uh, like a hospital or a um, uh, um, nonprofit organization like uh, National Kidney Foundation, something like that. Don't get it from a dot com. Don't get it from a news source. My goodness, news. Uh, you guys know, like everyone ha talks about uh, fake news. It's, it's it, all of it. But if you have a dot gov dot edu from a nursing and medical school dot org uh, and Wikipedia, keep away from that because anyone can touch Wikipedia. Actually, that's actually a a running joke in graduate school. There's a whole bunch of trolls who go into Wikipedia and they change data to be funny, to troll on people. That's why we don't like Wikipedia. Oh, what's another one? Medscape. Um, you know when they're trying to sell you a subscription to something, you know it's not good. So let's say for example, you thought um, electron microscopes were the best thing in the world and you have a really good rationale and you have really good definition. But then when you looked up stuff, the evidence stated something else. Right, you have to be open to uh, uh, to the truth. Right, so your conclusion does it agree? Did your research agree with your opinion? Right, because another thing that a lot of people do nowadays is my opinion is um, electron microscopes are the best in the world. So the only evidence that I'll put is microscopes are the electron microscopes are the best in the world. So that's my conclusion. Do you see how wrong that is? That's actually what uh, what uh, politicians do. They only find the data that matches their, um, their opinion and their rationale, right? Find data, right? And especially the data, try to find something from, you know, 2020, 2019. I had a student who was trying to uh, give me a protocol from 1987, all right? Think about it. Even let's say in 2015, remember what your, what your cell phone looked like in 2015? It looked kind of, it was kind of old. Right, you can't use a 2015 cell phone now, right? Well, if you're, you know, a, a person who uses electronics a lot, um, so this is how you can turn that one sentence right here into a full-grown paragraph. And I, why did I erase this so early? Isn't this what term papers look like? Don't you have an introduction, definition, your opinions about uh, whatever topic, and then you have the body. And then you have you get all the evidence, and then last but not least, you conclude. Oh, because uh, I believe this evidence that I found matches my definition and my opinion. And of course, after you do your conclusion, you do your APA seventh edition uh, citation, and that's what Ms. De Leon will be going over next week uh, at eight p.m. 
but this week at 8 p.m. on this, uh, this channel, she will be discussing, um, uh, which is really important, like how to avoid plagiarism and how to paraphrase. And remember, all of this should be in your own words because there's something called turn it in, or you can even just use Google. Um, your professor can actually match up how many words that you paraphrased from and to see an actual percentage. And if it's over 20% copied, or let's say you put way too many quotes. I love that when people put just quotes all over the place for your discussions, right? This book said this, and you quote the entire book. Remember, I want to know your thoughts and your interpretations of the citations that you got. So that's discussion one. And again, that's due next week before 6 p.m. before the 23rd. Now, all your lessons, you can go over these things, but we're gonna be going over these things. We're gonna be doing the microscope lab for real. And we're gonna be going over this video as well. And I'm gonna have in my announcements, notes and, and, and other pictures. And we're gonna go over this together as well. So what, what needs to be submitted for next week? Well, you have, uh, you put in a submission down here. If you click on this application assignment, you click on that, there's this worksheet, okay? So you take this worksheet and you save it and copy it or even print it out somewhere, okay? And then you click on this button and then, uh, well, we start here and then you read the, the case. And then you click on the button more and the case will also now give you some evidence here, right? So let's go back to, uh, just to give you an example. I'm gonna take this worksheet and I'm gonna copy it. And I'm gonna uh, copy it and put it in a Microsoft Word document. To make my life easy. That's if you would copy. Okay. So what you would do is, and much of it, so you read this case, right? Chinese woman. And this is, uh, uh, this is actually based on SARS-1, which was the kind of uh, one of the uh, coronaviridae family of the now infamous coronavirus. So you read through these things. And then that, that thing that I copied, this is the thing that you're going to hand in. What types of pathogens could be uh, causing this fatal flu? Now you could, you know, try to figure out in here, or you know, um, and uh, with a combination of doing your research in Google and or just having your guess, right? And right now we know that flu, okay, just as a little hint, it's a virus, okay. Now the thing about flus are. Uh, flu or influenza, the influ uh, influenza virus is actually part of the coronaviridae family, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, part of uh, current SARS-2 that's uh, plaguing this world, right? You could ask, what type of pathogens could be for the flu? Okay, gram stain results. So the gram stain uses light microscopy. What potential pathogens could be listed in question one? So. Can, uh, can a bacterial infection cause a flu? Yeah, look it up. Maybe, maybe not. That's your job to look it up. Which ones, and if it's a bacterial infection, which one's a gram stain? Are there other infections that you can't see? So just short answers, okay? Um, oh, this I love because this is apropos to what's going on in the real world. How big is a bacterial cell, right? And you could Google that, right? And uh, it's related to what's going on uh, with the mask debate, right? If, uh, how big are bacteria? How big are uh, viruses, right? And uh, can they go through this mask? Or what's the best mask? Now, the one that students always ask me on is uh, this chart here, which is uh, for the direct fluorofluorescent antibi antibody results. So that's part three. So you go through here. Right, and here's some uh, examples of uh, bacterial. Here, right, in that part three, the way you look at this is every test has a positive control, meaning this is what positive looks like for human uh, RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus, 
rhinovirus, influenza, and adeno. So this is what a healthy person should look like. You shouldn't see any glow in the dark spots. So there's a chart that says, this patient one, does anyone see any uh, disease state in my patient? Anything glow in the dark? Anybody? You can unmute and, and say yes, no, maybe. Anything here? No? Nothing, right? Looks just like a healthy person. But how about this one? So when you make a chart, right, what would the chart say? Patient one is what? Healthy. Patient two, what does patient two look like? Uh, healthy. They look like they have RSV, yes, thank you. Right, what does patient three look like? They got the flu. Influenza. Influenza, right? Anyone, by the way, know how many, how many people in the last year coronavirus killed? Anyone know? Five million. Right in this country, in this country alone. Anybody? No? Right? Remember right around Christmas time, it was like 400,000 or, or whatnot. Influenza, uh, in a six month period of uh, right, before, um, uh, right before coronavirus hit, killed 240,000. RSV killed closer to 400,000 people. Now, did we have lockdown in, in 2019? Something to think about. Oh, by the way, RSV in babies, that's a killer. Uh, does anyone know how many babies get hit with uh, coronavirus? Current SARS-2, anybody? Out of all the positive babies, it's 98.91, meaning if a child gets coronavirus, it will, it, goes, it will not only survive, because it won't get sick. Oh, by the way, that 1% or that 0.01% of the babies who got sick and died, they were immunocompromised to begin with, right? So that's one thing we already now know is for, you know, like all these viruses, especially um, RSV, if you did RSV, uh, like let's say we, uh, we, um, we got a class here of what? There's like uh, eight of us, right? If we did an assay or a test for RSV, um, about 30% of us would be positive. But Dr. Grias, why aren't we coughing? Why aren't we in ICU? Because, right? It goes, if you're positive for something, does it mean you're gonna get sick? Right? And we're gonna be talking about that. So keep that in the back of your mind. Just because you're positive, right? For RSV or a rhinovirus or influenza or human adeno, does it mean you're gonna have symptoms and gonna be sick? And so put that in the back of your mind. So all the things that you need for that chart that we just copied, this chart, right? And you know, the, that's the one with all the lines, right? And I could shoot you one that's a little bit cleaner or neater if you want that one, right? What's the advantage? Ooh, don't you think you can use a little bit of your discussion to answer this, right? What do electron microscope results indicate? Don't you think this can also be part, right, of your answer? So it's kind of like a combo, um, um, what do you call that? Combo homework. So it's not just one thing. So I know there's gonna be more questions about this. So you could give me a call while you're doing this, right? And uh, we could share screens and I could walk you through it. But right now, just know that uh, in the beginning, copy this worksheet, or maybe I'll, I'll make my own worksheet or uh, have a better copy of this worksheet. And then you run through all this, you keep on pressing these arrows here, and that gives you the data so that you can answer those questions, okay? So that is lesson one. And all of that, let's get back to the beginning. Okay, all of that, and that's right here. This is lesson one, and then the discussion two was right. I mean, the discussion one, lesson one, all of that is due before 6 p.m. Uh, on the 23rd, which is your next session. And of course, take a moment to do your task one. That's easy peasy, it takes five seconds. Well, I'm exaggerating, probably take a minute. 
just to fill out that form and sign it because we have laboratories and this is week one and you could kind of figure out look at our, uh, on your your calendar and I'm going to put the dates um, on the announcements um, we'll be having on campus classes starting in week eight and that will be <clears throat> in May May 4th 11th and 18th okay so uh, that will be announced and and if you can't make it you need to call me and we need to talk about um, alternative assignments and alternative things you can do. And by the way, you should go make it because we have very stringent uh, uh, protocols on um, you know, keeping the laboratory clean. No one's touching anybody. And the, the, the dissections for this class, especially the, the, the fetal pig is really important. And also you paid for it. Uh, if you look at here, this L-E-L-A right before here, that means lecture and lab and you paid lab fees. So, you know, that's non-refundable if, uh, if you don't come to the laboratory. But again, I do understand safety and you might have some high-risk uh, family members. Uh, again, call me, talk to me, and uh, we'll make other arrangements. I've had other students also come in on other days, one-on-one uh, -on -one to do their um, dissections because, um, you know, it's, it's actually the fun part of this class. Uh, when we used to teach this uh, before, um, you know, before the quarantine, I used to have labs every other day instead of lectures because I could easily put a video lecture for you guys. But the hands-on, that's, you know, that's a shame if you don't, don't come to it. And again, it's in the beginning of May when we start and um, it, it'll be in week eight, week nine, week 10. And week 10 is our final. And uh, for us here, um, we're starting now this week, week one. So let's look at, let's jump right in uh, into what's the, um, what's the lesson for today? Well, the first lesson is, is microscopes. Okay. So they have this virtual microscope thing here. It's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of iffy, but you know, I prefer that you guys come to the lab and then we play with an actual microscope. It's, it's easier, uh, easier done, but you need to know the parts of the microscope and you can look that up anywhere. And the microscope that we're talking about is light microscopy. So here's your typical binocular. So you have your eyepiece and since there's two of them, they call them binoculars right and you're supposed to when you look through these lenses you're supposed to keep both eyes open you have these objective lenses here they start off at four then they go to 10 40 and then 100 and the 100 x requires like a little film of oil to connect between the slide that you're going to put in here and um, the objective lens so if i ask what's an objective lens you'll tell them you'll point to this right and it, the smallest one is four, then it goes 10, then it goes 40, and then it goes 100. And 100 X or 100 magnification requires oil. Hence the term, the 100 magnification is called oil immersion. Immersion. Now you have this revolving nose piece. Sometimes they call it a turret. Sometimes they call it a carousel, but this thing can only be turned um, uh, clockwise because if you turn it counterclockwise enough, this whole thing pops out and you don't want that. This thing is called the stage and in it here, it has a stage clip. You have this kind of like little door down here and that's a condenser, right? And you have, of course, illuminator or light source. Um, they call this a rheostat, but it's just to control the dimness of this light source. And that's what the condenser here does as well. And again, we'll look at it much, much better when we're in lab, but part and parcel of this lecture about microscopy is that you gotta at least know the parts. This is the arm and the whole big bottom part here is called the base. You have these two knobs here. You have the big knob here on the outside, that's your course uh, adjustment or course focus. That brings this stage up and down pretty fast. And then you have the fine focus or fine adjustment, which is this little knob here. So do you think you can go home, find one of these things, right? and then uh, just erase all of this and put A, B, C, D, E, F, G, sure. 
Look, can I do this too? Parts of microscope quiz. Bingo. You think I could do the same thing? And then put that as your exam? And this is a monocular because there's only one. Okay. So that's also part of what you should be doing at all times. Oh, here, look at this. You should be already starting to think, what's going to be on the exam? What do I need to know? And also, what do I need to know uh, um, in the laboratory? Okay, so parts of the microscope is important. Now, now that I showed you parts of the microscope, and we're going to be talking about microscopy, scopy means the process of scoping or looking at, and micro, something that's small. Now, why? Why do we care in anatomy and physiology about microscopes? Well, um, because of this, uh, what's a better one? What's a nice picture that I like? There's one of a like this little baby girl because this one's missing some spots. Maybe if I write the word. Uh, atoms, molecules, because we have to get down to the chemical level. Here you go. I like this one. Let's look at this. Okay. And I don't know why they, as if we're not adults, or maybe this is for kids, who knows. We're going to learn a little bit about chemistry. And what's chemistry? Atoms, right, that make molecules. Molecules then make they get glued together and then make a cell. Cells get glued together, then make tissues. Tissues then uh, fold up and make organs. Organ systems get organized together and the different systems make up a human being. So when you get sick, something down this line happened. Remember homeostasis? Everything should be in balance. But if I have some genetic problems, which is at this level, don't you think it's going to mess up a molecule, then mess up a cell? How about if I have a bacterial or a cellular or um, a viral problem, which is down to this level? Don't you think it's going to start messing with things all the way downstream? And when you think about pathology, right? There's a joke in the hospital that internal medicine, we know everything, but we don't do, any, we don't, we don't do anything. Um, surgery uh, uh, knows nothing, but does everything. But pathology knows everything, but they know everything too late. Because by the time you're sick, patho, logi, study of, it's kind of semi too late. There's a lot of really bad going on. And that's why knowing and understanding anatomy, the parts, physiology, how the parts work together, at these lower levels, which is the first four weeks of this particular course, you then can understand how it affects the, uh, the organism or the human being as a whole, okay? So that's why uh, next week we're gonna go to atoms and molecules. But this week, we're gonna look at microscopy. We're, gonna, uh, we're just gonna start you off here with the cell. Because doing the atoms and chemistry, it's a little bit, for some people, it's a little bit intimidating. So let's look at, now, the one thing that you're gonna see here in this video, I'm gonna play it and then pause it. And also, sometimes it doesn't have the best picture, but I have these extra notes that I'm going to put in for you guys that have, uh, that have my, um, all the stuff that I was talking about and um, that I'll be talking about right now when I break down this video. So this video is important since because we don't have a microscope. Um, again, like I said, pre-COVID, if we were in the lab, um, I wouldn't be even playing this video. We just get all the microscopes out and then we start um, drawing and we start looking at the different cells. So now you know that atoms make up molecules, molecules make up cells, cells make up tissues. So let's look at these normal cells and this is cytology and histology is the study of tissues. So cytology is the study of the cell. So let's play this and I'm going to stop and pause and comment in between each. And I want you to start noticing that the form or how the shape of the cell or what the cell looks like is going to dictate a little bit of its function. So it'll help you with memory and it'll help you understand that there's that this body of ours is not 
random. And that's what's the beauty of uh, healthcare. It's not random, it makes sense. Everything else in this universe, when you think about it, it seems random. Laws, the way people uh, hang out with each other or the way that people don't hang out with each other. I, it's, it's hard to predict, but science, it's not hard to predict. It's reproducible. And you see the same thing over and over again. So let's look at this instead of me yapping all day. Hello and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology at Glen Oaks Community College. I'm Dr. Ren Hartung. For this video, we're gonna look at um, histology for at least the majority of the tissues of the human body. Um, what I want you to key up tissue. So let me try um, to get a better. Prepare a different way with different staining techniques, et cetera. Let's get a better slide of this. A big blood, blood vessel to me, but don't let that throw. Okay, um, here, here's a better and one. What I so let's look at this one and then I'll let it run. This is adipose tissue or a fat cell. All of these are fat cells. So what is, what is any, and you guys could unmute yourself and just call it out. Uh, what do you notice about it? What does it look like to you when you look at a fat cell? They look like a cluster of cells. Okay, that they're all squished together, right? There's not, there, there's not, they're, they're kind of squished together, but what else do you notice about these clusters of cells? Does anyone notice that it's big and it's round and it's empty? Okay, so how's this? If something's big and round and empty, don't you think it's gonna store something, right? Right? If you had like, a, uh, so with that said, what does this store? And you could see the nucleus is where? Typically we see, remember when, uh, if you're in high school or other college class, you see the nucleus or this thing here, right? Would be like in the middle. But in fat cells, everything here in the middle is empty and the nucleus is here on the periphery. So knowing and understanding that, that means the fat cell has to store something. And for us, it's glucose. Now, of course, on me, I got way too much uh, glucose. I eat too much garbage all day, and I don't do much. I've pretty much been sitting here in my basement um, looking at two computer screens since 8 a.m. this morning. So I lead a very sedentary lifestyle, right? So in theory, I shouldn't be eating much because fat cells stores, uh, fat cell also known as lipid, Known, also known as adipocyte, the fat cells, uh, fat cells sh store sugar. And it's not good to have no fat. And it's not good to have too much fat. You should have just enough fat to, get a, 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 to have a storage for your sugar. Because we're going to be learning that, especially when you start not eating or you maybe get into a starvation state, something's going to break down this cell to get that sugar out so we can use it. So this is a fat cell. And can everyone see, um, in the other class, they said it looks like packaging tape, you know, like bubble wrap. Doesn't it look like bubbles? Isn't that another thing that fat does? It's a nice cushion, right? right? If you got a lot of fat cells in your uh, gluteus maximus and you fall on the ground, it'll protect you. But if your butt is bony, man, it won't, won't be able to protect you as much. So isn't that nice? And doesn't this also look like insulation in your house? If you've ever looked at, you know, that bubble wrap kind of insulation that's in your house. And that's another thing that fat does. That's why if you're really skinny, cold weather isn't fun for you. But if you've got a nice little extra layer like I do, well, you're gonna be nice and warm. Let's look at the next cell. Because I just darkened the color a little bit more so you can see it easier, so purple, and those are without a hole in the middle kind of flat okay this is blood do you see the majority of the blood is of one kind of cell you see there's a whole bunch of pink does everyone see that i know it's kind of fuzzy uh, i have a better picture in my notes but does everyone see that it's like it's a whole bunch of pink cells and all the pink cells if you really look at it does everyone see it look like lifesavers right this is, there's a hole in the middle. So they look like Cheerios. And these Cheerios are red blood cells. The function of red blood cells to carry things. 
And isn't that what an inner tube looks like or a cereal, right? It carries things. So again, the form or what it looks like will dictate its function. Can I, uh, can I take a picture of this and then put on an exam? What's this cell? And you'll tell me it's red blood cell. What's its function? Well, you know that it, uh, it's uh, anucleated or doesn't have a, uh, doesn't have a, it has a hole in the middle. Well, guess what's in the middle of that hole? A nice little protein called hemoglobin. And you remember your medical terminology, right? All of you who took medical terminology with me, you got an A, yes. All right, hemo means blood, globin means protein, and oxygen and carbon dioxide sit on that. So you can see the majority of your blood is red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes. Now, if you see here, these purple, those are white blood cells, right? They're a little bit bigger. And this patient, they're okay. They only have a couple here and there in this field. But if you saw a whole bunch of purple, if you have a whole bunch of white blood cells, then what do you got? You have an infection, okay? So uh, old school ways before we had cell counters, in medical school, they make you, uh, and also uh, I think they still do that for nursing school. They make you count them. And then you, there's these uh, math, mathematical equations to make you figure out how many grams per deciliter is, uh, you know, red blood cell. So if I point at these pink things, red blood cell. If I point at this purple thing, this purple thing, this purple thing, that's a white blood cell. Now, what you can't see, well, maybe you can see a little bit here, uh, here. There's these little bits of dirt. Well, it's not really too visible on this slide, but those little bits of dirt are platelets. They get really sticky, and then when they gum everything up, they prevent you from bleeding to death. But I won't ask you for a platelet because that's too small. It would be like a little speck of dirt. But I could ask you about this red blood cell. I could ask you about this white blood cell. And in my notes that I'm going to give you guys, it, I found a really nice picture of, and this is a peripheral blood smear, which pre-COVID, if you were in my phlebotomy class, what did we do? We pricked your finger, right? And we not only do glucose and cholesterol, we also did peripheral blood smears, and then we mess around with these cells. Pre-COVID was so much more fun. Okay, where's the next, there you go. Structures, they're called platelets. They're... Next slide, this is dense, regular connective tissue. And the major feature that I'm looking at to see that it's dense, regular connective tissue is that it has kind of a wood grain appearance. You got these kind of lines going left and right. Now, connective tissue, it's stuff like tendons and fascia, which is the covering of muscles. Do you see how it looks like marble and they're all tightly packed and they're bands, right? So when you think about a tendon or when you think about, you know, the coverings of your muscle, you think of them as like what? Like bands of tissue that are tightly packed that'll protect you. And then they're, they're you know, they're semi-stretchy, but they're kind of strong. And then we're gonna be looking at a picture of bone that's gonna look a little bit like this, but a little bit different. So this is a connective tissue. And again, on my notes, I have classic, classic um, uh, pictures, uh, better than this, but you could see here, they have this marbleized or wood grain appearance because that's what it does. It, it provides support and uh, it holds up, you know, muscles and bones and uh, the surrounding tissue. All going in the same direction. There's lots of collagen here, lots of um, submicroscopic collagen fibers. Now we mentioned collagen. Collagen are proteins. And proteins, uh, collagen, you know, you heard those, um, those commercials that, you know, oh, Pantene with collagen. In real life, I could, I could wipe collagen all over my face and my hair. It's not gonna make anything better. But if you eat good food, that, uh, that then can metabolize into collagen, uh, that's much, much better. That's why I find some of these healthcare products and, and hair care products, I find it really silly, especially when they start talking about pH made for a woman, as if the pH of a woman is drastically different than a man. Uh, it's just, um, again, it's back to laypersons versus us, which are professionals, right? It's not that they're stupid, it's just that they don't have the training and they don't understand what how how science works so there's a lot of people who are in the you know advertising marketing world take advantage of that so collagen are these proteins that are in between and that's what makes your nails hard you know 
and uh, uh, and also that's what gives strength to your hair. Which, by the way, since it's a protein, how do you denature protein? You denature or destroy proteins with heat. That's why every time my wife gets, uh, you know, one of those hot oil treatments to, you know, to relax and make her hair wavy, she's just adding to future baldness. Those fibers are. But that's all okay. That's what wigs are for. That's what I keep on telling her. Direction, and that's what get. Next slide. This happens to be from skin, um, and what I'm wanting my students to be able to recognize here is that this area, this kind of more pinkish, I guess, maybe pinkish orange <laughs> color here, um, and the appearance of it, you've got um, collagen fibers again, like we had in the last slide. Yeah, not the such a good pick. Fibers are not running in just one direction; they're running in multiple directions shaft in the middle of a hair follicle now just to, uh just to uh reiterate regarding collagen to get strength but you, did you see how kind of disorganized this is and that skin that's uh, that's part of the different layers of skin well if you looked at the collagen collagen is way more i mean um like a tendon or a fascia the covering of muscles it's way stronger than skin and uh when we're doing our dissections in week eight and week nine uh, uh we'll show you that that um, the layers that have more collagen, they have greater strength to, uh, to protect us. And it's because if you looked at the other, um, uh, the other screen that had the organized, what's going to be more, more powerful or more, have more strength? Something that's organized versus something that's, as you can see here, that's not as organized. See, it's how, like kind of wavy and, and that's why skin is not as strong as like a tendon or uh, a ligament or fascia. Um, that's a little bit stronger because it has to, it has to, you know, form these bands and form these uh, things that protect uh, your uh, um, inner muscles and inner organs. This is a glandular type of tissue, of tissue. Now here's a better represent yeah, representation of skin here. Do you see how? There's a layer here, that deep purple, and then there's a light pinkish purple, and there's another layer here. And we're going to be also talking about skin in uh, future lectures uh, and the different layers and how important the different layers are. And you could see here, again, back to the form is dictating its function, and skin is very, very important. And here are blood vessels that are a little bit deeper. Good point at um, epithelial tissue. The surface part of the skin is made up of um, stratified squamous epithelium that is keratinized. Now, what does he mean by st squamous, stratified? Strata just means different layers, kind of like, you know, like a roof, like, you know, how the layers are all laid up on top of each other. Squamous means it's flat, because if you look at all the cells down here, they're a little bit more relaxed. But as we get to the top and to the outside world, which is, you know, it's a rough environment, you can see how deeper and how tougher they are and stronger they are. Hence the term stratified, which is different layers, squamous, which is flat. And now he mentioned, we mentioned collagen a minute ago. Now we're going to mention keratin. Keratin is an K-E-R-A-T-I-N is another protein that gives strength to our skin and our bones. And again, how do you get strength in your skin and your bones? Have good diet. I could lather keratin and collagen all over myself for $150 a bottle. Why would I do that? When I can just eat right and my body can make it for me. But again, the beauty industry, it's got a lot of like pseudoscience uh, uh, rolling around. And again, our layperson patient, they're not stupid. It's just that they, they didn't have an anatomy and physiology class. They didn't, uh, they, don't, uh, they didn't have a chemistry class, so they may not know what, uh, uh, about all of this. So this would be really clearly in. So for this slide, again, the major thing is true um, okay. that you could recognize for bone. This is bone. And these things here are called osteons. See one here, see one here. And they're... In the middle of this is an artery, vein, and nerve. And what does that tell us about bone? Bone is modular, and it is a living, breathing thing because it has an artery, vein, and a nerve. So if I break this thing, it'll bleed, and it'll hurt. 
because there's an artery, vein, and nerve inside each one of these Haversian canals, which is part of this whole unit here called an osteon. Now, do you see how they're in lamellae or concentrated layers? All the osteocytes are in layers. Now, another thing that we all know, like you ever play outside and break some sticks, right? If I break one stick, it's easy. But what happens if I take a whole bunch of sticks and I bundle them up and I tightly pack them like we did here in bone? How easy would it be to break? It would be much, much harder to break. That's why when we are in anatomy and physiology too, and we talk about how bones are so powerful and are so strong that, they, um, uh, that they're stronger than steel. And because they are, because uh, it has a, a lot of structure, right? Has a lot of uh, calcium and magnesium in between all these little things. And it makes it very, very light and it makes it very, very strong. So this is a picture of a cross section of a long bone that got cut in half. And uh, that's what that is. And then again, you could see the form, right? All these osteons like twigs all bound together and wrapped together, right? And it gives it a great amount of strength. So you could see here how organized they are. What happens if I have osteogenesis imperfecta, right? Osteo bone genesis creation of. Imperfecta means it's wrong. So what if these things aren't organized very well? Well, guess what happens to the baby's bones? They'll break. Just like that movie, uh, Unbreakable? Shoot, with Samuel these L. Kind of tree ring looking structures. What's are called? Uh, here's, a clo here's, a, here's a closer. And the thing, the spaces that he's calling here, right? They're called lacunae. But you could see the, um, this thing is an osteon and you could see in the middle, that's where uh, this, 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 this kind of tunnel there's a artery vein and nerve inside there. And for each osteon, uh, there's an artery vein and nerve in there. So bones are living, breathing things. And if I don't get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out and glucose in, then the bone will die. Or if there's cancer, you could easily see how it can travel from one osteon to another through these Haversian canals. So that's what gives it that tree ring look bone matrix area and then we have these darker staining areas toward in between those spicules those darker stained yeah, areas nice to know Let's get and the one. type of tissue that's actually yeah red bone marrow and up yeah. okay um we have the osteocytes living in here inside of the lacunae but we don't have the tree ring looking appearance that we saw earlier so when we look at this it's not as organized is it and this is cartilage but it has little bits and pieces of what the bone would have. But you could see here, it's wavy, not as organized, but it's still tough, but it's flexible. So when you feel your nose, the tip of your nose, right? Which I'm doing right now, right? That's what, cartilage. But then when you look at, when you press deeper or you press on your face, that's bone. And you could see form again, dictates function. It's a lot looser, right? There's a lot more spaces. Even look softer just by looking at it, it looks soft. This one happens to be from a mouse. Um, and that's why it looks a bit different than human. And the way you can recognize that it's highland cartilage in terms of major features, again, is the smooth appearance of the substance between the cells. And you can see less organization, it's smooth appearance, a lot more spaces. So this thing is going to be more spongy and more flexible than bone. And that's why this, you can easily identify it as cartilage. The substance between the cell your features. Since I mentioned, so here we are getting at Highland cartilage like this, and it has this kind of light More purplish cartilage. appearance appearance in spots. Let's get but notice that it looks very cartilage connecting them, the two vertebrae. So. And you could see here, which is a little bit, uh, they pan back a little bit. Do you see how it's not as tightly packed? And this is the cartilage between two bones. And, but you can see here on the bone, see how all this is all tightly packed. But this thing, it's all nice and loose. Neat. We see fiber for what I'm looking at. And again, we're looking at uh, but notice that it looks very different than dense. And again, we're looking at um, fibrocartilage. 
and you can see that the fibers go in one direction. Cartilage. Stratified columnar epithelium. Can you see this kind of okay. fuzzy bra? Let's talk about epithelia. We already know that the skin. We already showed you an example of it. And we showed you an example of uh, stratified, which was, um, you know, like, like, like shingles on a roof. They're on top of each other. This is called columnar because they look like a bunch of columns. And then you got to use your imagination a little bit. Some of them look like kind of like, you know, like a wine flute, like a goblet. And they're called goblet cells. And goblet cells make mucus because the inside layer, especially of your respiratory tract, has this columnar epithelium. There's an inside skin. And you guys see here this fuzzy part here? This is all cilia, which is these little fingers. Now, the goblet cells make mucus and it covers all here, right? So let's say viruses and other garbage floating around in your respiratory system, they get trapped in this mucus. And then what happens? The cilia starts doing what? Push, 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 push. And then you cough or sneeze or, you know, do one of those and you spit it out. And that is one of our main line defenses. And how can I recognize that epithelia? I recognize it because they look like columns, hence the term columnar. And I got a better picture in my notes. Some of them look like um, uh, little wine goblets. Uh, so hence the term they are called goblet cells. And that's, I, that's where in my head, uh, you know, they say, they call, you know, when you spit up, they call them goobers or uh, you gobbed on somebody or something like that. Remember when we were kids? Or maybe you guys didn't have that term when you were kids. But when I was a kid, we had that term, right? So that goblet cell, that makes mucus. Okay, and mucus is important because it forms a frontline defense. The cilia are also important because it has to push that mucus. So let's talk a little bit about pathology. So if I had muscular dystrophy, first thing that it does, it makes way too much mucus. That's not a good thing. And then the cilia don't move. So all the mucus gets stuck. What was in that mucus to begin with? All the foreign body, all the viruses and bacteria, because remember, Coronavirus isn't the only thing out there that can hurt you. Um, when, when I say there are 250 things floating around in our classroom that could kill you just as bad as coronavirus, I am not exaggerating. Uh, but as long as you have your frontline immune system, there's no break in your epithelia, your goblet cells are working and your cilia is working by pushing all that uh, nasty mucus that's, that's filled with all that um, uh, pathogens or potential pathogens, and that's why we're healthy. That's why when you sneeze, cover your mouth, right? And then what do you do with that tissue? You throw it away. Um, uh, a lot of our older patients love, uh, what do you call that? They love uh, 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 handkerchiefs. That's gross. My father-in-law, I had to get rid of all of his and he got so mad because it's a point source for infection. King border, there are, there's I believe this is large intestine. Um, and what we're looking at is another epithelial tissue. Now, doesn't this make sense? Do you see how there's way more space than the other ones? Way more open space here. There's another open space, there's another. By the way, these are called the Crips of Lieberkund, if you're German. Um, this is a small intestine. And the function of the small intestine is to absorb material. So you have to have more surface area. So does that make sense? So that's why your intestines wind down like that. So even on the microscopic level, you're trying to maximize the amount of, uh, of open space where the cells can absorb all your nutrients. That's why when I hear that a patient has like enteritis or, you know, Crohn's disease or something like that, I feel for them because that's some rough stuff. You see this line of cells here? Moving on to the next slide. This is another slide that looks very similar to the last one. Actually, it looks very different, but um, it's the same epithelial tissue. Notice that we have a single line of cells See, it's here, like a column. And also over here, but it gets kind of muddled as we get down. I think this is from small intestine. Oh, um, here we go too. See that? That's a goblet cell, goblet cell. See how it looks like a, like a wine glass or something like that? And in your small intestines, you do also have mucus. You have all these other, uh, other things as well. And again, you can see how it, it, there's a lot of space so it can absorb things. Again, look, 
columnar epithelium. So again, this slide is simple so, columnar. So you can also have columnar epithelial, like little columns, in also the gastrointestinal tract. And we also showed earlier, it's also in the, um, uh, what do you call that? Your, your pulmonary. And it makes sense. Okay. Moving on to the next slide. Oh, by the way, this slide happens to also be from a kidney. Um, and these are tubules from nephrons. Moving on to the next slide, this happens to be lung tissue. And what we see in these open kind of cavities, um, these are alveoli inside of lung. Um, and remember me talking about big... Okay. At the end of your lungs, you have these bunches of grapes called alveoli, or alveoli as that guy calls it. I don't know, potato, potato. Do you see how thin the walls are? It's only one cell thick. Do you see this? This is only one cell thick. This is a capillary. So your lungs have to be moist, not dry and not wet. So that you could see here, the space in between like this air and here. So if carbon dioxide has to go out, right? It can easily pass through, or if oxygen has to go, it can easily pass through. And you could see how if I had bronchitis, right, and I had way too much mucus, and I had all this stuff, all this uh, mucus filling up all these spaces, you can easily see how hard it is to breathe. So this is alveoli, thin wall, and this is a capillary, which is a, a very thin wall, only one cell thick so that the gases can go in and out. Cavities being adipose tissue before the, uh, is this um, capsule inside of the kidney. Now this is called the glomerulus, which is, and this whole thing here is called the Bowman's capsule. Now, when you look at this, doesn't it, again, back to the form equals the function. This is a capillary, of course, it's got, as you can see, you see the, uh, um, all the tubes in here. And you can see here, red blood cell, red blood cell. This is where it filters out the blood. And doesn't it look like a sponge, right? And what do you think a filter is? It's a sponge. So this is the area of your kidney, the microscopic part of your kidney uh, called your uh, nephron. And the more specific part, this is all your glomerulus where it filters. And this whole thing out here is called your Bowman's capsule. So you see this, you think sponge, you think, hey, it's a kidney. Do you think you can go home, take, take all the pictures that I have, right? And then, uh, and then make like flashcards for yourself um, or do flashcards on, on your computer? Sure you can. Don't you think that'll be a better way to study? Oh, remember we were talking about all this epithelia that goes round and round and round small intestine let's get to let's get to some other cool stuff oh remember we talked about keratin right um, and also hyaline cartilage you look here you see the outer layer of skin how it kinds of sloughing off but the lower layers are more compact that's actually how skin works the top the, the top part of your epidermis is actually dead it sloughs off but then when you go deeper, you have more cells to replace it. And when you're younger, it's quite efficient. When you're older, not so much. So it's squamous flake off. We have multiple layers of cells in the epithelium start when we let it be real. Also, that have been cut. Um, Let's get to muscle. Shall going we? across the muscle cells. Multiple nuclei. Characteristics of transitional epithelium is okay. it's capable of stretching a lot. And that may be why it was called transitional. If you stretch it out, if you make it really taut. Nice to know, cells transitional and epithelia. It's yeah. like, um, it's a skin that can, can, can expand. And uh, the one place that there's a lot of transitional epithelia is in your uh, urinary bladder. And that makes sense. Let it be really loose. You see this kind of appearance where we don't see a good defined cell shape. Moving on to the next image. Um, we're getting away from epithelial tissue now. Uh, notice that what we have are these long cells, almost like long tubes. And if you look close, you can see multiple nuclei on the edges of these long tubes. 
This is skeletal muscle. Let's look. Now, they call skeletal muscle striated or striped. In this particular picture, it's not easy to see, um, but they come in bands. And that makes sense because what's the only function that, um, that the muscle has to do? It either can relax or get longer, or it can contract and shrink. And uh, they form these cross bridges, and it makes sense if they form like these lines and these bands. So that's striated muscle. I got a better picture in my notes. Let's see if they, he, he shows a better picture. Tudinally, so imagine this is a garden hose and it's lying in this direction. Imagine the garden hose is facing you and we just cut it across. So all you see is a circle. That's the way these muscle fibers have been cut. And again, notice that we have nuclei kind of towards the periphery. So you see here, like they're stripes, striated skeletal muscle. And that's muscle that can be controlled. So right now my finger is controlling the mouse. That's filled with striated skeletal muscle because I can control it. But the rumbling in my tummy, that's visceral or smooth muscle. As you can see here, you don't see as much lines. This is higher magnification of that first skeletal muscle. Let me look at, hopefully he gets the skeletal. Ugh, you know what? I have better pictures. Uh, all right, that's good. So essentially there are three types of, three types of muscle. We already talked about, oh, here's another. We already saw this one, right? That's the striated. Did you see how, um, uh, what do you call that? The striated look like stripes. Well, here's a better, here's a, here's a better one. If you saw the skeletal muscle, do you see how they, they, well, this, they look, this one, they exaggerated it, but you could see they're like stripes. So there's a lot of nuclei and you can control these muscles. Now the cardiac, right? Not a lot of nuclei, but they have these, um, these little lines in between them. And those are called inter, uh, intercalated discs. They're full of calcium. And we're gonna talk about how calcium jumpstarts the electricity and your heart needs to jump that uh, electricity. Now, if you look at the smooth muscle, do you see it doesn't form like these organized stripes like, uh, like skeletal muscle? The smooth, uh, the smooth muscle, also known as visceral, you can't control these. These are run automatically. Like, you know, when your stomach rumbles or, you know, uh, uh, makes a loud, funny noises, you have no control over that. When you swallow something, you can't tell your body, hey, stop swallowing. It'll do it on your own. Um, so you have three types, skeletal, cardiac, smooth. Skeletal, think stripes, striated. Cardiac, think intercalated discs, not a lot of nuclei. Smooth, think, eh, it's more wavy and not as organized as skeletal or cardiac. And the neat thing about cardiac is, is that it, uh, it has its own electrical, elect electrical system and hence the, the, the need for these intercalated discs that are full of calcium. Let's go back to this. You can see the individual cells better. So you can imagine way back here, all of these little tiny cells, they've just teased them up, these from that company, long tubes, but oh, between the long see, tubes, we've got these dark lines. Intercalated discs, one cell cardiac. From the next cell, nice. those dark lines and interconnect the dark lines again that are the intercalated discs. This is obviously another view. kind of out of focus. Right. Muscle. This is so that's all of the major histology um, okay. that I have. And that's then they're done. So what type of tissue is this? Oh, that's a good question. So what type of tissue is this? Call it out if you want. What does it look like? It's organized, there are bands, all right? Remember we talked about collagen fibers in between. Well, that's what you'll be, that's what you should be able to do. What type of, what type of thing is this? Remember, you had these cells, they carry things and these cells were like for immunity, right? So 
when you look at my notes and you look at the pictures that I have in my notes and I took either screenshots of this video or I, um, um, I got like, um, I got pictures of, um, uh, from the, the interwebs that were, uh, were better. And so look at that and that will all be posted in uh, announcements. Next thing is a chain of infection. So let's watch this together and then we'll break down this video. And, and actually, when, especially if you're in your online class or you, your professor assigns videos, that's the best way to look at videos. Have like a scrap piece of paper on the side and um, you know, take down little notes as things go along. Wow, so loud. Chain of infection. In my previous session, we have spoken about what is the chain of infection, what are the elements forming the chain of infection. Oh, I remember this video. Today. Hold up. You know what? I don't like this video. Sorry. I remember her. Even though she's, I think she's a nurse or a doctor, but I like this picture better. Let's see. Uh, that's, that's a nice, it's a nice simple, because these things are complicated. I like, okay, this one's nice. Let's look at this. So the chain of infection, this is what happens, right? When you get sick. You have a causative agent, and it's called the um, uh, it's called germ it's called germ theory. Well, it's not a theory; it's actually real. We now know that people get sick because their immune system has failed them some way, and the pathogen, which could be a bacteria, it could be a virus, or it could be a fungus, is now inside and causing all heck. Now, there's no such thing as a good bacteria, bad bacteria, good virus, bad virus. Bacteria, viruses, and um, fungi, they just want to live. But the thing is, if they live in our system, it's going to cause problems. Okay? So these causative agents, it all starts with a reservoir or a point source. And that's why with all this COVID stuff going around is that's why we're obsessed with uh, you know, who you were with, uh, how long you've been in contact, because the rev reservoir or the point source is usually asymptomatic. This person will not have, will most likely either have subclinical or no symptoms, no symptomology, right? So that's why we're the big school debate of whether the kids should go back to school or not. It's not, remember I quoted, it's like 98.19% that a child would get sick. The thing is, all of us who have kill children know that what? Kids bring stuff into the house, right? They are the reservoir. They are the point source of infection. And that reservoir infection also could be an animal. It could also be a, uh, an insect, okay? And if it's an insect, it's called a vector, right? As in it's uh, a vector is something that goes in a certain direction in, with a certain amount of force. And like something like mosquitoes or ticks, uh, which by the way, the weather's getting better. People are going to be walking outside more, walking in the woods, right? It will be an increase of point source of infection. And there has to be a means of exit from this reservoir from either another human being to another person. Mode of transmission, and there's several modes of transmission. There's direct contact, and that's uh, that's with most viruses. That's why we have to be six feet apart, right? There's airborne, right? It could be floating around the air. Droplet, if you sneeze on somebody, right? Like that, like that, uh, that girl who messed with that Uber driver, right? Cough on somebody, you sneeze on somebody, that's droplet infection, okay? Uh, for HIV, it's what? Bloodborne? So there's got to be a way of getting out of the body of the reservoir to something else, and then 
there has to be a portal of entry into the person at risk. Now notice how we didn't write everybody. That is where a lot of the fear mongering is going on right now with COVID. We have to focus on the people at risk, the immunocompromised patient. That's why we're always talking about how's your stress level and all these things because if you are immunocompromised or elderly, because the older you get, especially beyond the age of 65, your immune system isn't as efficient as it was when you were 19. And definitely you're 85 years old, multi-systemic problems, how much risk are you gonna be? So you can see how the protocols that we have here in the pandemic, its function is to break the chain. So for example, you're a reservoir, I'm wearing a mask, it slows things down to get out of my out of out of my body, right? Other people are wearing masks, it can't get through. We're six feet apart. Many people are wearing gloves. No one's hugging each other, no one's touching each other. Everything's being uh being sanitized 18 million ways over. Well, in my opinion, pseudo-sanitized, but in the hospital, it's definitely being sanitized at least five times a day. And uh, that's why we wash our hands before and after each patient. And we don't just wash it regularly, we perform a proper clinical scrub. So you could see here, I could ask, what does it mean to have the causative agent? That's the actual thing that causes the disease. Who gets sick, the reservoir or the person at risk? The immunocompromised person, right? Who is the carrier? Reservoir, okay? What ways can I sp uh, prevent the infection? I can prevent a means of exit out of my reservoir. I can prevent by uh, blocking up a portal of entry into my immunocompromised patient. And what are the modes of transmission? We talked about airborne. We talked about direct contact. We talked about droplet. We talked. Uh, uh, we also talked about uh, bloodborne, like HIV and uh, uh, what's the other one? Hepatitis. Those are the two biggies. HIV and hepatitis. So that video that you can watch that video as well, but I like the, uh, these, these pictures better. So let's look at, let's look at this other stuff. See, so you can see how, right? If I have a susceptible host, I break the chain by doing what? Boosting their immune system, right? Uh, and you can see there's ways of, uh, of uh, and all the stuff that we were talking about. You wear the mask. Right? Don't, don't shake hands, no direct contact. But I'm telling you, a lot of places, especially my gym, it's pseudo cleaning. Uh, but in the hospital, that's not pseudo cleaning because every, every day and every week of the hospital, um, Department of Infectious Medicine, uh, which is a sub-department of internal medicine, they run te regular tests in the hospital to see where all the germs are at. And also every weekend they look at all the, and it's called the nosocomial infection, infections that you get when you're in the hospital. And uh, the very, hospitals nowadays, they're very good at promoting getting the patient in, getting the patient out as quick as possible. Okay, so it, uh, da, 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 da. it is at this point that uh, I'm going to uh, stop the recording.